access talks. So this talk is about how to, when you're doing laparoscopic surgery, how to access the abdomen. So the general steps, you first you want to make a hole in the abdominal wall to get through the peritoneum so that you can put the CO2 in and make your pneumoperitoneum. There's two ways to do it. There's an open way and there's a closed way using a thing called a Verice needle. And we'll talk about um, each of those. So once you get once you get in, you insufflate and you use CO2 to do that, put in put in your scope. You can play, place any secondary trocars that you might need, and then you're ready to um, do the operation or whatever you're doing in the abdomen. And the big concerns when you're gaining abdominal access are twofold. The first one's injury to the bowel, and the second one's uh, major vascular injury. So abdominal wall anatomy, there's a simplified way to look at abdominal wall anatomy that works pretty much regardless of where on the wall you are. So that's you have skin and peritoneum on your outermost layers. Then you have a fat sandwich with variable layers of uh, fas fascia and mus muscle in between. So you have subcutaneous fat, you have preperitoneal fat, and then inside of that fat you can have different um, fascia, fascia and muscles depending on where you are. So here's one example from over on the later lateral abdominal wall. So you'd have skin, then you'd have an outer um, fatty fascia, camper's fascia, and then inside of that you have scarpus fascia, and then your muscle layers, so the external, internal, and transversalis. Transversalis fascia, preperitoneal fat, and then peritoneum. So there's, with regards to fascia, there's, it's kind of confusing because it seems like it's used in lots of different contexts, but there's three sort of ways to think about fascia. So there's one, there's a superficial fascia, which would be like campers or scarpa's fascia, which is underneath the skin and blends in with the dermis. Then there's dense fibrous fascia, which surrounds um, muscle and bones. So that could be like a transversalis fascia. Then there's fascia that starts with P, the letter P. So those are the ones that surround organs, which is like a serous type fascia. And so for example, the, around the lungs, you have the pleura. Around the heart, you have the pericardium. And in the abdomen, you have the um, peritoneal fascia. So these, these ones have visceral and parietal components, and it's easiest to see with the heart. So for example, we're drawing the pericardium. So around the heart, you have the visceral component. And around the space, you have the parietal component. And then there's a real or potential space between those. So those are your fascias with P's. And so for us, the, it's the, in, the, in the abdomen, it's the peritoneum is the fascia we're talking about here. So there's five folds in it that are important to know about. And all these travel up and head up towards the belly button. So the middle one is the rachis, urachus remnant. And what's that called? That's the median ligament or the median fold. And then so you, lateral to that, you have the umbilical artery remnants. What do, they, what do they make? They make the medial ligaments ending with an L. So that's here. And then lateral to the uh, medial ligaments, you have the, the the most lateral fold called the lateral fold, which is um, underneath that's the inferior epigastric arteries over there. So for the muscles, you got the three muscle layers on the lateral wall, so the external oblique fibers running down like you're putting your hands in your pocket from the costal cartilage on along the ribs down to, towards the linea alba. All three of these um, lateral wall muscle layers go to the linea, linea alba. Then you have the internal oblique, so that's coming off of the inguinal ligament, ischial spine, um, thoracolumbar fascia, and that's headed also to the linea alba. And then you have the transverse, transverse um, transversalis muscle running horizontally, like so. The rectus abdominis, that goes from the pubic symphysis all the way up um, to the xiphoid. Blood supply, the anterior abdominal wall, the most important vessel supply, and that's the inferior epigastric artery. And so that comes from the, we'll see where that comes from here. So we've got the abdominal aorta dividing into the common iliacs, common iliacs divided into internal and external. The external iliac becomes the femoral artery after the inguinal ligament, and before that it gives off the inferior epigastric artery. So that's, the, that's where the inferior epigastric artery comes from, off of the external um, external iliac artery, and it meets up with the superior epigastric artery. And we'll see where the superior epigastric artery comes from in a little bit. So here's the arcuate line, so that's obviously important in abdominal wall anatomy. So um, are we above or below the arcuate line right now in this cross-section? We're above it. So we have the anterior rectus sheath and the posterior rectus sheath, which tells us that we're above the arcuate line. So as a review of what, of what these things are and what makes them, so you have your, your lateral muscle layers, the um, external and internal oblique, the transversalis, and the ape neuroses of those comes and divides up into the anterior rectus sheath, which is from the external and oblique, um, and half the internal. And then you have the other half of the internal and the transversalis forming the posterior rectus sheath, and then they come together in the middle, making the linea alba. And 
Then here it's also good to note that the transversalis fascia is here. That's the dotted line. So the transversalis fascia um, is different than, uh, is a separate thing than, than the part of the apen roasted, the transversalis mus muscle that forms the posterior part of the rectus sheath. So for example, below the arcuate line, you don't have the posterior rectus sheath. All three of these travel above, but you still have um, transversalis fascia underneath the rectus muscle. All right, so surface anatomy. We can start out with stuff we know here. So we got the aorta dividing at the navel, the belly button, um, T10 is the dermatome, belly button. So where's McBurney's point? Just again, just to, be, to do stuff that we already know about. So where's McBurney's point? It's the anterior superior iliac spine, the navel, about a third of the way between McBurney's point for appendicitis. Where's the arcuate line? We can use kind of a similar way to think about it. So we have the navel, the belly button, pubic symphysis, and then if we go a third of the way down to the pubic symphysis from the belly button, we have the arcuate line. Right, so it's actually um, pretty pretty similar to where um, McBurney's point is, except for you're starting at the navel, go a third of the way down towards the pubic symphysis. Okay, so abdominal access techniques. There's the open one, so that's that's called also called Hassan's technique, and you can do this pretty much anywhere in the abdominal wall. And you're doing it under direct visualization, so you're looking with your eyeball to watch the layers as you cut down. And this is the best to do if you're really worried about something underneath where you're cutting, like an adhesion, because you're you're not doing it blindly like you are when you're using the the Varese needle. So the the steps are so you incise the skin, get all the way down to the preperitoneal fat, cutting through the layers, blunt dissect this preperitoneal fat away, grab um the peritoneum, pull it up into the wound up into the wound you've created with a hemostat, and then you um, make a little hole in the peritoneum, put your finger in, sweep around it, make sure there's no adhesions underneath where you are, and then you can put the trocar in um, with the CO2 gas line and establish your pneumoperitoneum. So then there's the close technique, which is the other way to do it. This is most commonly done at the belly button, so we'll draw the belly button here. So underneath that, you'd have our, some abdominal fascia, like linea alba. Then you'd have uh, peritoneum. And so you take the varice needle, you put it in at about a 45 degree angle, which is uh, another safety type um, measure because there's there's a lot of important stuff underneath here. There's abdominal aorta, and there's the common iliacs that divide off of that. So you want to, if you put it in at an angle, it helps to make sure that if it goes in too deep, it doesn't stab. Um, straight down really far. Okay, so when you put the needle in, you're going to hear two pops and a cl click. And this is a quiz question type of thing. So the first pop is abdominal fascia. The second pop is the going through the peritoneum, and the click is the third thing. And that's so you have the needle here like this, which has a sharp beveled edge and it has a safety style out on the inside. So once you get through the peritoneum, um, there's less resistance, and the needle feels that, and the safety style that comes out. And so this is a dull. Um, a dull thing that pops out of the needle so you can't damage anything on damage anything further like um bowel or, or the major vessels so that's the click that you hear that's the safety stylet so abdominal fascia peritoneum and then click the safety stylet popping out so the pros and cons it's this is comparing to the open and so this is faster less risk of a hernia but there is an increased risk of major complications because you're doing this blindly that's why you want to do it at um sort of safe safe sites like the belly button Pneumoperitoneum. So the pressure is usually about 15. It works like a furnace. So if the if the pressure goes down a little bit, it puts more CO2 in. You can put in higher pressure when you're putting in secondary ports for a brief amount of time. So you can crank the pressure up a little bit. And so here's the abdominal wall, and here's important things like intestines. And you're putting in this secondary pore. You're jamming that in. You want to make sure you don't hit this stuff, so you can increase the pressure to create a little bit more resistance for you to push against. Then there's physiologic effects of creating the pneumoperitoneum, so I think about this twofold. So there's one, it's stressful, so you have an increased MAP, um, systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance, and then two is more of a mechanical. So you're increasing the pressure, which is like putting a big mass um, in the abdomen, so that decreases the venous return. So less return, what does the heart rate do? Well, it tries to go up to compensate. It can't though, it can't quite compensate, so there's less cardiac output. And also vital capacity. Again, that goes along with having this big um, s sort of mass of, of, of CO2, high pressure in the abdomen, less vital capacity. So what happens to the, to the pH? So you have CO2 coming in. What does CO2 combine with? It combines with water. Combar uh, carbonic anhydrase here. So then that makes bicarb um, and 
strong acid hydrogen so what you'd think would happen would be that the pH would go way down since you're putting all the CO2 into a person um, but it doesn't it doesn't drop in a clini clinically significant way um, because there's endogenous buffers and you bre you blow off more of the CO2 so there isn't a clinically significant drop in pH so how do you ensure that you've that you've, um, that you've made that you how do you ensure that you're inside of the peritoneum before you fill, you fill it up with CO2 you can do something called the water drop test so let's say you were wondering are we inside it or are we not inside it you put some water in if the water drop freely flows in that means you're inside the peritoneum I'm going along with the reduced pressure just like the reason why the safety stylet popped out of the varice needle you can also inject saline in here and try to suck it back so you, if the water goes in that means you're probably inside the new peritoneum and you can start um, putting the CO2 in if the pressure goes up really quickly and the abdomen is not getting inflated that means you're probably again not inside they're not in the right place so adding additional ports. The important thing is here is you want to avoid the inferior epigastric vessels, the most common um, vessel injury doing, during, uh, doing pelvic surgery this way. So there's two ways to do it. There's two landmarks you can use. You can help you. You can use the medial umbilical ligament and the round ligament. We'll go back to our picture here. So let's say we put our camera in with our uh, port at the belly button. Then we can look around and we find the medial ligament umbilical artery remnant and then we look lateral to that we should see a lateral fold which has the inferior epigastric artery and if, if we make sure that we're lateral to that fold put the put the other trocar in here then we're, we're okay we've missed the inferior epigastric another way to do is we can look to see where the round ligament enters the deep um, inguinal canal so the round where the round ligament enters the deep inguinal, inguinal canal is just lateral to the inferior epigastric so if we go if we, if we find the round and make sure we're lateral to it again using the same idea we're okay we're safe So this 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 gets back to the where does the superior epigastric come from, and it's also I'm um, just like a good anatomy thing to learn. So we got the starting with what we're familiar with. We have the arch of the aorta, um, brachiocephalic on the right side, dividing up to the right subclavian and the right common carotid. Then we have the left common carotid, and then we have the left subclavian. So what so that's that's sort of familiar. We have that in our brains. So what is the what comes off the subclavian, and how do, how do arteries come off of that? That's a little bit more tricky. And so you, to do to remember that, you remember. Um, vitamin D, vitamin C and D. So the V is for vertebral, first branch going up, making the posterior circulation to the brain. Um, second is I, that's internal thoracic, and the, what's the other name for that, especially in surgery, is the mammary. And so that comes down, gives off the intercostals, and also divides up into the um, superior epigastric and the um, musculophrenic. So that's where the superior epigastric comes from. It comes from the um, internal thoracic artery, which comes off the, the subclavian right near the vertebral. And then to keep, keep going, we have the thyrocervical trunk. So what comes off the thyrocervical trunk? We can start with how it's named. So thyro, inferior thyroid, um, cervical, the transverse cervical artery. And then the third one is just hard to remember. It's a supersca suprascapular. Um, and for the C and D, so we have the, the costocervical and the dorsal scapular. So these ones are a little bit less important. The dorsal scapular, for example, supplies some muscles um, in the shoulder. It might be more important in other contexts. All right, so the accessing the belly button. So what is the belly button? This is the most common site, like we talked about. So it's diffusion of um, fascial layers without subcutaneous fat, which, is, which is, makes it a good access point most common for the varice needle. The posterior part of the belly button is the fusion of these, lig of these ligaments, so the median coming from the um, uracus, the medial, the, um, the umbilical artery remnants. And we talked about how those folds all meet up at the belly button. And then the contraindications to using this site would be umbilical hernia or abnorm abnormalities of the uracus. So remember the uracus is what um, drains the fetal bladder. So we'll draw the bladder here and then this is the median um, ligament connecting the bladder to the belly button. So this would be if it if the uracus is closed down properly and formed that ligament. But there can be abnormalities. For example, you can have a cyst, which would be a failure of um, fusion right in the middle. You can also have a polyp, which is a failure of fusion down here at the belly button or a diverticulum over here. Or, or it can just be patent. There can actually be a little connection between the bladder and the belly button. And that's the um, peds type of question or thing where you have um, urine coming out of the belly button. So complications from from doing this um, abdominal access to do a laparoscopic procedure. So most importantly, they happen when you're trying to gain that initial entry to the peritoneum and create pneumoperitoneum, and that's large um, vessel injury or bowel injury. The most common vessel um, injured by number, however, is the inferior epigastric. We talked about some ways that you can avoid damaging that um, vessel. 
and just general complications. So you reduce bladder injury by using a Foley. You reduce DVTs by using um, PCDs or SCDs. So do, do you guys know the difference between a PCD and an SCD? It's kind of a factoid thing, but so there's the general term is ICD, so that's intermittent compression device, and then there's PCDs, which are pneumatic compression device, and then there's SCDs, sequential compression device. So SCDs, these are the things that, the boots that go around the leg. So SCDs have chambers like so, like so, and they fill up sequentially. So this one squeezes, then this one, then this one, then this one, whereas PCDs are just one big chamber that all fill up and squeeze at the same time. All right, so stomach and bowel injury, you can put it in an um, OG tube to help... Um, Keep air from um, too much air from getting in there and reduce the chance of injury to the to the bowel. And so some more unique ones to, to doing things laparoscopically: CO2 embolus, pneumothorax, hernia at the trocar sites, which is why you um, close larger trocar sites, and then shoulder pain, and that's from irritation to the diaphragm, distension of the diaphragm. So C three, four, five refers up to the shoulder. Nerve injury. This can be from um, from cut, from making cuts in the abdomen or just from patient positioning, like damage to the um, femoral cutaneous nerve, L2, L3, can cause anesthesia to the anterior thigh, or um, posi positioning at the at the knee can injure the um, peroneal nerve. So contraindications to doing um, laparoscopic procedures and, and getting access to the abdomen, so these are, these are relative, and so people use judgment to decide about what to do here, but there's two ways to think about it. So one is things that make it hard to access the abdomen, so adhesions, or dangerous adhesions, um, distension, or a mass, and then I'll, the other one would be things that make pneumoperitoneum dangerous, so cardiopulmonary disease, diaphragmatic hernia, and another thing you could add would be shunts, right, so if you have a, like a VP shunt draining into the abdomen and you um, increase the pressure a whole lot, then that would be bad because the shunt um, wouldn't be able to drain, or drain as easily. So a little bit more on bowel injury, so if there's fever, tachycardia, or ileus, that's when you suspect bowel injury. After a laparoscopic operation, the patients should be, you should, they should be getting better um, fairly quickly and making improvement every hour. And so, if they're not, then you should get um, worried about injury. And if you see this, you should be worried about injury to the bowel. And so, let's say you you are worried, and then someone shows you a, um, a CT or something or an X-ray that shows intra-abdominal air. Would that make you super concerned that you've damaged the the, the intestines after? A laparoscopic operation? The answer is no. You wouldn't be. You, you might be worried about it still, but you, it's not um, conf confirmatory proof that you're seeing air in the intra-abdominal air because after laparoscopic operations, most people or a lot of people are going to have air um, if you, if you did imaging on everybody. But if you see the air increasing over time, then that would make you worried. It should be it should be decreasing over time. And then also, if you're if you if you're looking at the Foley bag and you see blood in there um, or air in there during the operation, you could um, ask about that. So shoulder pain, is there anything you can do to reduce the shoulder pain that people um, feel? So they've tried things. One is tr to try to get all the CO2 out. So you keep the the um, ports open, you put the patient in T-Berg, and then you give some PPV breaths to try to get all of the positive pressure ventilation breaths to try to get all of the CO2 out and see if that could help. And then you can also irrigate the peritoneum with locally anesthetic. I don't know if those are really used very frequently, but I just thought it'd be an interesting thing you could maybe ask about. So physiology of pneumoperitoneum, so it's stressful. We're going to have increased MAP, systemic pulmonary vascular resistance. It's a, it's a big mass. It's going to, um, a big bunch of pressure in the abdomen. It's going to decrease the venous return. The heart's going to try to compensate. It's going to increase the rate, but it won't be able to fully compensate, so you have a lower cardiac output. Um, again, with the pressure and the mass, you're going to have a decreased vital capacity. Let's say it'll take a big breath, which makes sense. And then why do you use CO2? It's non-combustible, less chance of a CO2 embolus. When you're putting that various needle in, um, what are the what are the pops? What are the sounds they hear? What are the things you push through? So the abdominal fascia, peritoneal fascia, and the safety style at clicking out. The general advantages of laparoscopic: faster recovery, less pain, less scarring, less ileus. How to how to avoid the inferior epigastric? Make sure that you're lateral to the round ligament. Do you need to close trochar sites? And closing means that you're closing um, the fascia underneath the site. I mean, you always you always close the skin or do something with the skin, you don't just leave it open. And yeah, if it's bigger than 7 to 10 millimeters, um, you should be closing that um, site to help prevent um, hernia. So those are the those are the questions, type of quiz questions that I got asked um, doing laparoscopic operations, doing the abdominal access part of it. And then, so questions that you could ask, um, do people use the techniques that we talked about to reduce shoulder pain? It'd be something that you could be um, curious about.
Okay, so that's the laparoscopic 